In Module 3, we will discuss risk factors and preventative strategies for BPD. By the end of this module, the learner will understand the risk factors that are associated with the development of BPD and will be able to describe BPD risk prediction models and preventative strategies for BPD. Many potential risk factors for BPD have been identified. However, it is difficult to isolate true risk factors since most of the data are observational data and many factors interact with each other. This table separates into prenatal, adverse, and postnatal factors, summarizes some of the risk factors that have been associated with the development of BPD. Some of these factors, such as low gestational age, low birth weight, and intrauterine or postnatal growth restriction are well-recognized risk factors for BPD, while some others, like chorioamnionitis, remains controversial. Over the years, many models using clinical parameters at an early postnatal age to predict BPD have been developed. In the systematic review and external validation study, Onland et al. find that out of 26 clinical prediction models of BPD, only four models utilized external validation and none presented calibration of the predictive value. External validation demonstrated that except for two promising models, most ex existing clinical prediction models are poor to moderate predictors for BPD. One of these two models that showed good calibration was the NICHD BPD calculator. This model calculates BPD risk at six postnatal ages using gestational age, birth weight, race and ethnicity, sex, respiratory support, and FIL2. For example, a black male infant born at 24 weeks gestation with birth weight of 520 grams has 25% risk of developing severe BPD if he is intubated on 25% oxygen on day one of life. This risk increases to 27% if he is intubated on 25% oxygen on day 14 of life and increases further to 36% by 28 days of life. Now let's talk about some strategies that have been considered for the pre prevention of BPD. We will start with efforts to modify the prenatal risk of BPD. Multiple studies have shown fetal growth restriction and born small for gestational age increase the risk of BPD. For example, the extremely low gestational age newborn study have found a three-fold higher incidence of BPD in infants born at less than 29 weeks, with birth weight more than one standard deviation below the mean. Therefore, good prenatal care to treat maternal morbidities, such as pregnancy-induced hypertension and decreased environmental exposure, such as maternal smoking, to reduce the incidence of intrauterine growth restriction might be effective. Antenatal steroids has become the mainstay of prophylactic treatment for threatened preterm births. In addition to decrease the incidence of neonatal deaths, RDS and IVH, antenatal steroid has been shown to reduce the need for mechanical ventilation, or CPAP, time requiring mechanical ventilation, and time requiring supplemental oxygen. However, treatment with antenatal steroids has failed to show statistically significant reduction in BPD. In the next four slides, we will concentrate on the respiratory support strategies for the prevention of BPD. Mechanical ventilation and associated volume and barrel trauma have been implicated in the pathogenesis of BPD, and therefore, many efforts have been spent to develop new respiratory support strategies to either avoid or decrease trauma from mechanical ventilation. One major change over the last 10 to 20 years is the widespread use of non-invasive respiratory support, including nasal continuous positive airway pressure, nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, and high-flow nasal cannula. A recent meta-analysis of seven randomized trials comparing CPAP and intubated mechanical ventilation at birth in infants born at less than 30 weeks gestation demonstrated a small but significant benefit of CPAP in preventing the combined outcome of BPD or death. 
The two recent Cochrane reviews compared other modes of non-invasive ventilation methods to CPAP, and found similar efficacy of high-flow nasal cannula and NIPPV for preventing BPD in preterm infants. In addition, synchronized NIPPV seems to be more effective than CPAP as primary respiratory support after birth, with less need of intubation and it's also better at preventing extubation failure. However, the data on high-flow nasal cannula and NIPPV are still limited, especially in the extremely preterm infants born at less than 28 weeks gestation. Over the years, efforts to limit ventilator-associated lung injury has led to the promotion of dental ventilation. Dental ventilation can be accomplished by allowing for permissive hypercarbia, and the use of volume target ventilation strategies. Permissive hypercarbia implies that by liberalizing PCO2 targets, there is a reduction in the need for mechanical ventilation. The concern is that targeting normal carbia exposes infants to more ventilatory support, and that's more lung injury. The oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve shows us that hypercarbia also increases oxygen unloading in the tissue by shifting the curve to the right. The current understanding is that hypercarbia at moderate level is not associated with adverse events as opposed to hypocarbia, which is associated with periventricular leukomalacia, hearing loss, and overdistension of the lungs. Minimal liberation of PCO2 targets, that is over 52 versus less than 48 millimeter mercury, has been shown to reduce the need for mechanical ventilation. However, the data to support this strategy has been inconsistent, and long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes remain unknown. Another dental ventilation strategy is volume-targeted ventilation. This strategy is aimed to limit volume trauma and achieve automatic weaning of PIP, which can potentially limit ventilator-associated lung injury. A 2010 concrete review of 12 randomized controlled trials comparing pressure-limited ventilation with volume-targeted ventilation reported a reduction in the combined outcome of death or BPD with volume-targeted ventilation. Data from randomized controlled trials have suggested that both high-frequency jet ventilation and high-frequency oscillation have the potential to reduce the risk of BPD. A recent Cochrane review analyzed 19 RCTs of elective high-frequency oscillation involving 4,096 infants. In these trials, randomization and commencement of treatment needed to be as soon as possible and usually in the first 12 hours of life. This revealed a small reduction in the incidence of BPD, but also found notable inconsistency across the 19 included studies. In addition, many infants require more sedation with high-frequency ventilation. Therefore, prophylactic use of high-frequency ventilation remains controversial. For more than 10 years, the question, what is the optimal oxygen saturation target for very preterm infants have been the center of investigation and controversy across the international neonatology community. Although several fairly large trials found trends towards lower rate of BPD in the lower saturation group, none were significant. A recent meta-analysis, including five separate trials comparing low saturation targets of 85 to 89 percent, and high saturation target of 91 to 95 percent did not identify differences in the outcomes of visual disability or BPD, but raised concerns for increased risk of mortality at 18 to 22 months corrected age, with lower saturation targets as well as higher rates of NEC. Based on these findings, many units now use higher saturation limits of 91 to 95 percent and some even suggest that higher targets of 93 to 97% should be considered with established BPD to reduce risk of subsequent pulmonary hypertension. In terms of pharmacotherapy to prevent BPD, very few have been shown to be efficacious. This includes caffeine, vitamin A, and systemic steroid use. However, 
due to the concern of significant side effects, early systemic steroid use in less than seven days of life for the purpose of BPD prevention is not recommended, and the decision to use systemic steroid at seven to fourteen days of life for this purpose need to be weighed against potential harm in each patient. In addition, a recent Cochrane review noted that early administration of inhaled steroids within the first two weeks of life results in significant reduction in the combined outcome of death or chronic lung disease at 30 weeks postmenstrual age among all randomized neonates and among survivors. Even though the results were significant, the upper confidence interval of the number need to treat to benefit was infinity which means we would have to treat every baby with inhaled steroids to prevent one baby dying or develop BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. This would not be acceptable in clinical practice. A list of other medications and therapies have been studied, and current data do not support their role in the prevention of BPD. This list includes surfactant, prophylactic indomethacin, or PDA treatment of any kind, inhaled nitric oxide, bronchodilators, diuretic, late-inhaled corticosteroids, and some antioxidants. For example, surfactant was shown to decrease oxygen at 28 days compared with intubation and no surfactant, but no benefit for BPD when compared to early CPAP use. In preterm infants less than three weeks of age developing chronic lung disease, Furosemide administration has either inconsistent effects or no detectable effect. This concludes Module 3. Thank you for your attention. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, Neo Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.